All right. Um, so let's continue. Um, we are happy to have Manuel Asatunikuber, who's going to tell us about the effects of high derivative interactions on classical So thanks for introduction and thanks for the organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. I'll join Andres and the other speakers in saying I would have loved to take this opportunity to go to LA, but let's hope for next year. So today I'd like to talk um, about some work I've been doing with uh, my supervisors, Gabriele Travaglini and Andy Brandhuber here at Queen Mary in London, as well as with uh, Stefano De Angelis. We have been working together essentially for most of our PhD, and he will have a talk right after mine where he will discuss more recent work we've done together in the standard model DFT context. Whereas I will take, so to say, a step back in time and tell you about something, what we were up to uh, last year, specifically uh, content of this paper. So background, this doesn't come to much surprise, I guess. It's a two-body problem, which is a very interesting problem in its own right. But of course, after observation of gravitational waves at, uh, uh, in, at the end of uh, 2015, an incredible boom has, has occurred. And we've had already many talks discussing the amazing uh, progress which has been made over the last years, months, and in various different aspects of this. What I'm most interested in is the extraction of classical physics from amplitudes. In particular, what I would like to talk about today is uh, the deflection angle and the time delay coming from uh, the iconal phase, when in the theory we introduce also higher derivative operators. In particular, these are the ones I call R cubed, R to the fourth, and FFR, which I will introduce in the next slide. But before doing so, I just want to briefly mention that there has been a lot of work on uh, several of these operators from several different perspectives, including, of course, double copy relations, effects on high U, on UV physics of R cubed or gravitational radiation from R to the fourth, positivity bounds on R to the fourth. Of course, all, also other works I'm not mentioning about, um, but which have been discussed in the first days of, uh, of the conference and modification to, to a potential coming from R cubed. So there's been a lot of interest in these operators. Now, um, as I mentioned, I want to get to the deflection angle and the time delay, and I want to get there through the icon phase. Uh, we will only look at leading and subleading contributions, which depending on which operator we will be looking at, this goes up to one loop. So we will use unitarity to do so. Calculations will be relatively simple. And in the end, if I have time, I would also like to make some brief considerations about radiation coming from R cube. So this is a theory we will be considering. And so we have the heavy, uh, the heavy scalar, which will mimic uh, the black hole or the heavy object from which a light particle, massless, in this case specifically either graviton or photon, will be uh, scattering off. And out of these interactions, this is what I will be calling R cubed. This is not a great notation, I have to say, um, in the sense that uh, maybe Simon's notation was better in calling this Riemann cube. We know that always when we have bridges in the game, we can always shift them away through some field redefinition. So I call this R cube, but I really mean Riemann cube, and specifically these two combinations, where this particular one has been chosen because it happens to be topological in six dimensions. But yes, it's just these two combinations. Now then we have R to the fourth, which in four dimensions have these uh, three independent uh, combinations, where the second one is parity violating, and we will at some point set these beta two to zero and only consider the first and the last contribution in this case. And then we have this FFR, which already Brando talked uh, about in, in the first day. We'll be considering this as, this as well and the deflection of photon due to this. So a brief mention about the kinematics, the process we will be looking at is, um, as I said, like this heavy scalar, which deflects then these massless particles. Um, uh, word of caution, for some reason, we use a convention which is not the usual convention in the sense we have here, VS channel instead of a T channel for the momentum exchange. But okay, this shouldn't be too much of an issue. We call omega the energy of the massless particle. And another small uh, warning about the notation. Here, these arrows depict the physical situation we are interested in. But in the calculations, we always do all outgoing states. So the elicities here will have uh, an opposite convention in the sense that 
When we have a plus plus case, what we actually mean is that this is a holistic flipping. When you have a plus minus, this is actually holistic reserving. As I already mentioned, we will be working in uh, four dimensions. So uh, this is just parameterization of the spinners. It's not really important, but I just wanted to stress we will be working in four dimensions. So we will be taking advantage of the power of spinner holistic formalism. And since we just go up to one loop, this doesn't really uh, take away anything from what we are doing. Uh, yeah, because traditional terms, of course, do not, do not contribute to the long range physics and, and in this case, and we are not doing higher loops, so this cannot even enter in, in front of the calculations. Now, once we computed the amplitude, we will ta be taking this limit. And after taking this kinematic limit, we just transform into impact parameter space, and then we look at the econol phase. Now, the relation to a tree level case is very simple, and the one loop case, uh, we get uh, just a relation with a part of the, of the amplitude and the other part will give us a consistency condition which will be needed in order to actually get the exponentiation, the exponentiation of uh, the economic phase. Now, uh, it is important to stress that in general, um, the economic phase is a matrix. So you're not guaranteed to always have um, holistic preserving, uh, situ holistic preserving situation, let's say. This is particularly true if you have this higher derivative operators, which give you a complete uh, sort of, uh, of matrix. And um, this is different from the Eisen Hilbert case, where at leading order, you, for example, here I brought up this example, you will just have this is what is the holistic preserving state. So you will have a diagonal matrix here and this prefactor. Um, the solution to this is we diagonalize, and once we have done this, we can extract. The, uh, the angle and the time delay using these expressions. So I just wanted to briefly mention, of course, there are several ways of extracting uh, the deflection angle. Um, some of them are summed up in this very nice paper by Emil and collaborators. So I think there's four or five of them in there, but we just chose this because it's very nice and clean in the sense you get the amplitude, you get the echo phase, and then you get the angle directly. Essentially everything is on shell. Okay. So uh, let's start with our cube. Um, our cube gives contributions at leading order just to the uh, helicity flipping uh, situation. This is exactly zero, whereas this is just the contributions, the leading contributions in the energy. And at sub leading, I brought up here the expressions before transforming into impact parameter space um, because I wanted so a brief remark on this here. We are interested in the classical part, so um, we're not really interested in the quantum effects. These quantum effects at one, at one loop, in this case as well, are embodied by these bubble coefficients. So in principle, we could just do triple cuts, we could do leading singularity or whole Martin classical limit and try to get directly to this piece. But it's actually nice doing the double cut in the sense that we like getting boxes because the boxes is what in the end will uh, give us the exponentiation from the tree level. So this always gives us a nice consistency check. And in particular, this shouldn't be taken for granted if you add these higher derivative operators. So checking exponentiation is one of the things that we want to do. And also the quantum bits um, for us were not interesting in this instance, but they might be interesting um, to others in the sense that uh, these could, whereas the definition for VA comma also, which takes into account uh, quantum bits. This is a paper by Divacchio Russo. I should have brought up these papers here, but um, luckily I'm very bad with references, it seems. And also, if you go to higher loops, these quantum bits can actually come in at the moment of doing the exponentiation and checking it in order to make everything fit. So, since one loop is relatively simple, computationally, this is not expensive at all. We just did a double cut. Now, before moving on, I would like to um, briefly mention how the R cube enters here. We, by, okay, more specifically, how the different uh, operators enter the game here. Um, I find it interesting when only one of them enters uh, the graviton amplitude, whereas both of them enter the amplitude with gravitons and scalars. So uh, I, I find it interesting to ask, could we have expected this? So let's get back to something which we know very well. So the three point uh, graviton amplitude. Now, if you just look at the um, 
mass dimension of uh, three point, which is one. You just look at the helicity scaling, which you expect for the gravitons. And of course, you exclude uh, non-local theories because else you could also have uh, inverses with the bracket switch. Then you just have these two situations. And of course, the, the conjugates in the, in the minus case here. Now, if you set H3 to be minus, this will just give you what we all know to be Ice and Hilbert. And then on the other hand, if you set this to be plus, then this is the only, uh, this is the only contribution you can get. And you expect this to be on R cubed simply because it's a mass dimension six, then you fix appropriately the coupling and you get, uh, you get the free point. Now we pick this to be I1. So what about G3 instead? Now let's assume you just picked one of these two papers and reading through it, you find these expression for the tree level amplitude. So this is Einstein Hilbert plus the G cubed. And um, what you see is this, this is just Einstein Hilbert plus this contact term. So how do you expect this to look like? Well you look at the helicities, you would expect an R square. You have scalars here, you expect from the M squared here, five squared. And then here you've got an S, so you have two contracted momenta, which essentially means two derivatives. So you expect something like this in the end. And indeed, if you look at the G cubed, you apply some identities, some field redefinitions. In the end, you will find that this looks exactly like this. And so you can essentially interpret this object as a tidal effect, um, which explains why it only enters in the scalar scalar and graviton graviton and not in the pure graviton amplitude. So looking at the uh, equivalent matrix you get, as I mentioned, you only have realistic flipping contributions. So I'm sorry for this very ugly notation. That's the only thing that the iPad was able to read and was different from a normal B. This is just a way of decomposing the scalar product in such a way that after diagonalizing this, it recombines nicely into V square. Once you do so, you will get this, uh, this phase. And out of this, you immediately get the, uh, the time delay. So now looking at the time delay, what you will realize is that independently of the sign, of this thing here, now it's, uh, it's this alpha prime. Like this, you can just think of this whole thing as a, as a coupling. Independently of a sign of that, you will always have a situation where a small enough p can actually lead the second term to overpower the first one and this to become negative. So you will have a time advance. This is what we expected after this paper. So um, this was a problem in our EFT setting. It shouldn't because uh, if you look at this, crank some numbers, in the end, it turns out that this happens at values of p, which are such that our EFT has already broken down. Now you go to subleading level. And as I said, you want to check that the exponentiation holds, and indeed it does. And then you can go ahead, compute the computer phase, compute the angle. And once again, the same behavior appears even at subleading order for the time delay. Now, what about R to the fourth? Here I'd like to go through a similar reasoning than before. We have a Lagrangian, so in principle, we could just um, go through the whole machinery, compute the um, uh, the Feynman rules attach to the states and get the amplitudes in the end. So I don't want to give impression that uh, I'm one of the people uh, Andres was mentioning, hating Lagrangians, but I just like this way of thinking much better, which is, I know it doesn't, R to the fourth does not contribute to a three point, so let's look at four point. I write down all the helicities for four point. Now I try to understand what the amplitude looks like just analyzing uh, the properties of this, of the amplitude. We know the mass dimension, we know that for every single graviton, you need to have four spinners of this type, at least four of them contracted in an appropriate way. And now we try and list all the possible ways for this uh, for these contractions to, to happen, introducing this shorthand notations for the um, three, let's say, building blocks of the Schatten identity. And you quickly realize that considering the plus, these are the only four ways you can actually um, uh, contract these uh, the indices in such a way that Bose symmetry holds for the amplitude, right? Because you want to be able to swap any two particles and still get out the same result. Now, as I mentioned, these are just the building blocks of the Schouten identity. So you know that this holds. And using Schouten identity, you quickly realize that all four of these structures are related. So just pick one of them, the simplest one, we choose this one, and this will give you the amplitude. Same, uh, same game holds for the other holistic configurations, the old minus and the MHV. This fixes you the amplitude, uh, this fixes the amplitude completely up to the coupling. 
So in principle, we choose here three arbitrary different couplings, beta plus, beta minus, and beta tilde. If you now get back to the Lagrangian and actually do the calculation and uh, get the amplitudes once again, you will find these relations between the betas we have put in front here and the betas which were in the original Lagrangian. Now, as I mentioned, we discard the parity violating bits, so we set beta 2 to be 0. And this will give you then beta plus, beta minus. We just set this to be beta. And as expected, this leads to the fact that you conjugate this one and you get this one. Okay, so um, as R to the fourth does not modify the free graviton amplitude, you also expect this to be vanishing, which indeed it is. And this leads to the fact that the leading ECMO phase is zero. At this point, you look at the subleading one, you get uh, these expressions and sort of consistently with the fact that there is no leading term, there are also no boxes inside these expressions. So there is no exponentiation happening. And you go ahead and you compute a phase, you get the angle, you get the time delay. And this time, so uh, here we have what I'm writing down as the variation of uh, the time delay only due to the operator. So um, there should be also an Einstein Hilbert bit in front of this. If you look at the complete thing, now um, you can still, since this is proportional to this combination of the couplings, you could ask yourself, is there a way of combining the couplings in such a way that whatever value of B I choose, independently how small this is, I will never get the time advance. And there is, you just need to set these to be positive. And this relates back to the beta one and beta three in the original Lagrangian. This just restores you this positivity uh, bounds which these people have found. Now you have to always take this with a grain of salt because of course in our EFT, we will never be able to take this B as small as we want. So this was just to make a connection with previous talks. Now, let's look at FFR. Um, this, on the other hand, you have uh, the leading and subleading once again. Um, this has, depending on whether you look at photons, whether you look at the gravitons, it has a behavior which is ever similar uh, to R cube. So in this case, we look at the photons and you see that the behavior is similar to R cubed in the sense that you once again have the Einstein Hilbert part and then the additional piece coming from the FFR with a sign in between. So you expect as it indeed does, um, that looking at the time uh, at the time delay, you will have a possibility of small enough betas, uh, Bs making this, uh, this negative. And again, you just, uh, you can then look at the, at the subleading contributions, you find the same behavior. And in the end, these are the expressions you get. On the other hand, if you look at uh, the graviton deflection, this will have similar behavior to R to the fourth. There will be no leading contributions. So once again, the leading ECMO phase is zero. Here you'll need uh, some amplitudes, some more amplitudes. I just display them uh, for the sake of having them here. Now Q square is electric charge. And we get a very simple expression for the subleading contribution. And this time, um, it does actually look exactly like Einstein Hilbert in the sense that you only have felicity the serving terms. And this leads you to this diagonal matrix, this, uh, uh, this deflection angle and this time delay. And once again, this is proportional to the coupling. So in principle, you could say, okay, if I fix this to be positive, I will never have time advance. Now, one thing I uh, forgot to mention about the R to the fourth. So if you now look at this, uh, at the delta here, you will have power one in uh, omega, which is what you would expect. But interestingly, if you look, uh, sorry, here I'm going farther down. If you look at the R to the fourth, you actually have omega cubed. So this is a behavior we didn't expect and which would make it interesting to go actually to higher order and check whether exponentiation still holds despite this behavior. Okay, so after this, I just wanted to uh, briefly mention something about radiation. So as you could have guessed, I really like amplitudes and doing things the onshell way whenever possible. But this doesn't mean that uh, a priori, I always think this is the best way of doing so. So I just quickly um, wanted to mention an example where um, it might, there are actually faster ways to get to where we want to get. This uh, in particular um, refers to the last paper we had last year. And the idea was to look at um, 
the gravitational wave flux and the waveforms um, coming from R cubed. Now, if you want to, uh, to do so, what you need is essentially the potential and the quadrupole. These will enter the waveform in Vn. The potential, we already had it coming from these papers. So we just need to compute the quadrupole. And the quadrupole only gets this very simple contribution at leading order, as only this diagram, with this being the R cube term. And so from matching to this point particle action, you should be able to easily read off what the uh, quadrupole looks like. And indeed, it, uh, it is relatively simple to do so. So you can compute this. Uh, these are the expressions for the I1 and I2. I2, I'm sorry, I never mentioned it so far. It's just the second Riemann um, contraction we had in the inside the G cubed. So more specifically, we can just quickly go back here. Um, this is, uh, yeah, sorry. This is not what I wanted to do. Uh, okay, this bit here is what I called I2. And Okay, now I lost. Okay, so uh, we computed this for I1. Uh, so the mode. We computed this for I1. We computed it for I2. And now it's simple to recover G3, just a sum of the two contributions and setting up the one to zero. So now here uh, you will simply expand these components into the normal statistic components. You can read off the term which is of interest to you. Later on, I will just expand this uh, to the leading PN order because this is what we, what you're interested in. And for the sake of comparison, I also took the, so we also took the title interactions. In particular, we took these, uh, this action where this first part is the part which will resemble what comes from GQ in the sense that uh, GQ had actually more than one contribution. It was uh, something like R squared, phi squared, M squared, minus uh, nulla squared, R squared, phi squared. So this bit actually only contributes uh, quantum parts. So for us, the relevant piece is this one. So what we want to look at also is this title interaction Lagrangian. And this in particular will be the the bit which we're more interested in. Once again, contributions are very simple. It's just these two diagrams and potential scheming by these offers. So we can once again extract the expression here, read off the part which we're interested in. Here we introduce the neural relativistic normalization. And in the end, we define these coefficients in such a way that here essentially just read off the Newton potential and expanding them in uh, leading PN order, you get these expressions. We don't really want to focus this much on this, but just to mention it. And in the end, in order to get the flux, we will also need, so we use the total energy per unit mass. This is, uh, all of this is essentially following along the steps uh, of this paper where I analyzed R to the fourth, following along earlier work by Senator and leading collaborators. Um, so this is the expression for the unit mass, the wave, wave flux. I mean, you compute it, you go through the hoops, and in the end, you will get this, this expression here. I guess the hardest part was really make this look like something acceptable. These are just symmetric combinations of coupling of some sort with also dependence on mass. And here we compared this to earlier work by Henry Fayem Lachet, checking that what the parts of this which they had matched, and of course, in the end, they did. And once you have this, you can get to a waveform in frequency domain. We use this stationary phase approximation, which I think uh, is also known as, what was it, Taylor F2. And these are uh, uh, the waveforms you get. And of course, if you compare this with previous known results on R to the fourth, you will see that kind of as expected, this has a lower, it, it should be leading in the powers of V. You have five minutes with questions. Okay, uh, so I'm essentially done. Just as a summary, um, I wanted to discuss the eigenvalue phase matrix and the equalization of these higher derivative operators. Where, as I mentioned, it would be interesting to go to 
higher loops and check the r to the fourth, which we have still this small puzzle going on. Um, I briefly mentioned some aspects of this radiation from r to uh, r cubed, but one of the main things I wanted to do is actually talk about r cubed and r to the fourth, giving this different perspective on them, on the operators themselves, because this is meant to sort of a bridge to what Stefano will be talking about. This uh, was a big part of the work in the Star Model EFT, so I hope this was a good teaser for them. Okay, so thank you for listening. Okay, questions? Can I ask a quick question? So these are, what's the H bar counting of these R cube operators? Because like on this picture that you showed when you inserted it on this, like on the graphicon exchange line, it seems like compared to Einstein Hilbert, there's like an additional H bar suppression because of the additional derivatives. So are you saying this is like, it's a classical effect or is it a quantum effect? No, it's 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 still classical. So um, yeah, it, it is it is still a classical effect. We did the counting in the uh, where is sorry, yeah, notation. Okay, so here we just fed in the full thing. We didn't worry about picking out the classical pieces right away, which we could have done. But being the whole thing simple enough, we just plugged it in and did the scaling afterwards. And what I showed you here is just the classical part of it. So yeah, it, it is still classical. I think, I think that's on the car of their use. So if you yeah. use M-Park, then that's really quantum. If you have additional scales like- Sorry, I, I, I can't hear you. Oh, so just a small comment on the original question. So I think that a little bit depends on the scale they're using. So if you have been plug uh, for this high dimensional R cube, then these are of the same order as quantum. You so put in it superficial one over H bars. To make no, it no, it's not that. It's, it's the string scale, right? So 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 imagine if this coming from string scale or some other in physics, then this could be classical. So maybe, effect, right? Yeah, maybe maybe a related question or another way to phrase it, Enrico's question is you have alpha prime here or, or whatever scale of new physics. Do you know how low that has to be so that it's, uh, it's not uh, comparable to say one loop corrections to Newton or something like that? Uh, just roughly, <laughs> yeah. Or um, this, this is a very good question and we did this at some point. But I have to be honest, I, I simply I simply don't remember. We didn't put it in the paper in the end. It's one of those things where literally cranking through numbers to check that everything was meaningful and kind of consistent. Mm -hmm. I apologize. I literally can't remember what the value is. That's wrong. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, maybe we can, if anyone has a question, you can ask on Slack, so let's thank um, Manuel again.